In 1981, protests against racist policing spilled into violence. For three days, from Friday the 10th of April 1981, the area of Brixton in South London became the scene of an uprising which left at least 45 people injured, 279 police officers injured, over 100 cars, including 56 police vehicles damaged, and 82 people arrested. The spontaneous revolt saw violent clashes between the predominantly black young people of Brixton and the Metropolitan Police Force, and homophobic businesses were also attacked. The uprisings initially began with an incident when Mike Bailey, a young man who had been stabbed, was subsequently stopped by the police several times, who ultimately removed him from a taxi while he was on his way to the hospital. A large crowd gathered, and when the police called for backup and more police arrived, their provocative actions meant violence soon erupted. Over-policing of multicultural communities and the use of police powers, particularly stop and search, known as the SUS laws, had become a major point of contention for many of Britain's black people. During the 1970s, a moral panic about muggings meant that working class black youths began to be represented as troublesome and potentially criminal. SUS or suspected person laws were resurrected 19th century vagrancy laws which gave police the power to stop and search anyone they suspected of intending to commit a crime. These powers were abused by the Metropolitan Police, the law enforcement agency responsible for policing in London's 32 boroughs. They were used not only to harass black people but also to commit violence against anyone who was considered to be loitering with intent regardless of whether or not there was any evidence. Stop and search powers were disproportionately used against young African and Caribbean people who became frustrated about being harassed and victimized by the police. Operation Swamp, however, proved the last straw. 10 days prior to the uprising, 150 plainclothes officers flooded Brixton, making 2,000 stop and searches, but only 150 arrests in the first four of what was planned to be a 10-day operation. This flagrant abuse of power and racism from the police led to hugely increased tensions, which culminated in the uprisings just a few days later. For the Lambeth Area Youth Committee, the cause of the Brixton uprising was an emotive response to the continuously heavy handling by the police. They reported that Brixton's black youth felt that Virtually all of them, at one time or another, had been required to undergo searches, often aggressive, while going about their ordinary businesses. Brixton's queer community was another frequent target of the SUS laws. The law criminalising homosexuality in Britain had only changed in 1967, and queer people were still very much treated as second-class citizens well into the 1970s. They were continually policed and punished by the law. After the South London Gay Community Centre closed in 1976, the political activity of the radical South London Gay Liberation Movement remained based in Brixton, squatting in Railton Road and Mayall Road, and they collaborated with local black organisations in campaigns against fascism and oppression. When the police descended on Brixton in April 1981, Britain's queer community stood in solidarity with the black community, and many actively joined the uprising. The events of the 10th to the 12th of April 1981 have been contested and people disagreed about what was happening as they occurred. The picture painted by the UK's police, politicians and media was one of race riots in a black inner London suburb which drew on persisting racist stereotypes of black criminality. This however was markedly different from the eyewitness testimony 
of multi-ethnic Brixton locals, business owners, black community organisations, individual police officers and emergency workers who were in Brixton that weekend. For those eyewitnesses, the untrue rumours circulating that Michael Bailey had died after police had detained rather than helped him should have been proactively squashed and then relative calm would have returned to Brixton that Friday night. The altercation with the police, as the crowd pulled the young man from them to take him to hospital, had effectively ended within an hour of, of Michael Bailey's departure. Although the police were aware of the damaging impact of allowing the rumour to spread unchecked, nothing was done to counter it. Just two months after the black community mourned the suspicious deaths of 13 teenagers in Newcross, just five miles from Brixton, following which 20,000 black people participated in the Black People's Day action a month later, news of another black teen's death, untimely, was allowed to spread rapidly. Historian Emma Craddock has extensively researched the varied accounts of the Brixton uprising, including using material exclusively available at the Black Cultural Archives. Many eyewitnesses reported that on Saturday morning, the 11th of April, the police, who had resumed the provocative operation, were excited and spoiling for a fight. They behaved with unnecessary brutality and verbally abused and provoked random black people with shouts like, come on then, you black bastard. She noted that statements taken included claims that the police had pushed people who were standing on their own doorsteps, that they dragged people along the ground, aimed kicks at people's heads, rushed in groups against individual black people, were throwing bricks, and one group of police officers ran into a shop and attacked everyone inside, leaving bloodstains on the wall. For many witnesses, the police created, rather than prevented trouble. Their presence and their behavior aggravated an already volatile situation. Even the counsel to the later Scarman inquiry condemned the police for wrong and highly provocative behavior. That Saturday and Sunday were filled with verbal and physical clashes, property destruction and insecurity. But on Monday morning, the people of Brixton were beginning to survey the damage. Community groups, including Brixton Black Women's Group and the Black Liberation Front, had campaigned against the SUS laws under the Scrap SUS initiative, which was founded by concerned black mothers and was active for several years by the time of the uprising. Scrap SUS created leaflets and flyers raising awareness about their discriminatory application and the extent to which the justice system failed to provide those who were arrested under SUS with a fair trial. Following the revolt in Brixton, the government set up an inquiry into the uprising, which was led by Lord Leslie Scarman. The community also sprang into action and formed the Brixton Defence Campaign, mainly by two groups, the Brixton Black Women's Group and Black People Against State Harassment, in order to, and I quote, coordinate the defence of those arrested during the Brixton uprising and to support those who continue to be victimised, end quote. The Brixton Defence Campaign supported those wrongfully charged and challenged the racist narrative presented in the British press and official government reports. Credit's investigation into the Skarma report suggests that the aftermath of the Brixton uprising presented a huge but missed opportunity for Britain to grapple with itself and its racism. Ultimately, Skarman prioritised the accounts of the police over those of the police, the consequences of which would be felt for a generation. The Brixton uprising is one example among dozens of communities up and down Britain who took to the streets in a long timeline of struggle for equality and justice in the 1980s, notably in Southall, in Toxteth, Handsworth, Tottenham, Mossside and Orgreave. And a year before Brixton, Bristol had also been the site of its own uprising. Although initially founded in response to the April uprising, Brixton Defence Campaign grew into a larger movement which fought all forms of racist oppression in the, across the UK and supported those charged after other inner city uprisings in Toxteth and Mossside. The work of the Brixton Defence Campaign sought to demonstrate that the response of the black community to the uprising was to continue to fight against the oppression that had caused it.